I was lost with a broken heart Pick me up, now I'm set apart From the ash I am born again Forever safe in the Savior's hands You are more than my words could say Follow you, Lord, for all my days Fix my eyes, follow in your ways Forever free in unending grace Cause you are, you are, you are My freedom, we lift you higher Lift you higher Your love, your love, your love Never ending war Oh, oh, you are alive in us Nothing can take your place You are all we need Your love has set us free Oh, whoa. At my very first Farm Progress show in Decatur, Illinois, in the late 2000s, I was amazed walking around the different booths. After all, I'm a city kid, and there I was planted all of a sudden in the midst of the agricultural world. There were these stunning technological advancements I didn't even know were out there. Drones that could survey fields in the sky, precision farming that could drive and even turn combines with GPS. And then there were the expensive, what I call Cadillac versions of everything that costs only a few organs to purchase if you have extra. But what started the most for me was walking in and sitting down in the mini hall they had established, this outdoor little amphitheater for a unique demonstration, what I like to call a tractor or combine beauty pageant. An announcer with microphone in hand began to highlight all of the curves and talents of each piece of equipment. But in front of all of this, an artist began to paint on a huge canvas that could spin 360 degrees. Music started to play as he feverishly took paint, the reds and the, the blues and the yellows, and they exploded onto this canvas, painting to the music. But I have to be honest, as he painted, it looked more like Jackson Pollock abstract art than anything purposeful or meaningful. That is, until the very last second. As the music was coming to an end, he rotated his canvas and let it spin over and over and over, and he stopped it at just the right point. And suddenly, there was a farmer standing in a field. The sun was beating down on him, sweat on his brow, a painting he dubbed the life of the farmer. It was only when the last paint hit the canvas it was only from the right vantage point that the overarching story popped. If you remember those plastic bookmarks as kids, what's known as lenticular printing, it's an image that if you rotate, if you change the angle just slightly, the picture changes. Now you're looking at the same bookmark, you're in the same place, in the same moment in time, but it's a different angle that brings out something unique. Today we're going to find that through the book of Revelation in our series, He Reigns, where we're going to take these images and put the puzzle pieces together. We're going to find the right angles that bring the overarching story out, where it's vivid, meaningful, powerful. As we look back at John, as he wrote about the world ending three times at least, through the seals, through the trumpets, and through the bowls. He tells the same story of ending, but he recapitulates it with greater intensity, changing the angle so that we can see a message for the church where we know where to stand, we know our purpose, and we know how to live our faith. As he challenges his audience to embrace all three answers. Each section works the very same way, that there are six seals, then there's a pause in the seventh. There are six trumpets, a pause, and the seventh. There are six bowls, a pause, and the seventh. And it's in the midst of those interludes that John's internal message to believers becomes clear. So let's go back 
to the very first question that John answers. Who can withstand God's judgment? Who is John talking to? Who is this faith for? The question comes right before the interlude in Revelation chapter 6, verse 17. For the great day of the wrath has come. And who can withstand it? Chapter 7 is the answer to that question, the interlude. It's a question that sounds a lot like the prophet Nahum from the Old Testament, who asked, who can withstand his indignation? Who can endure his fierce anger? And his answer is beautiful. Verse 15 of chapter 1 of Nahum, he said, Look, there on the mountains, the feet of the one who brings good news, who proclaims peace. He looks forward to the one who would become man, the one who would take the cross, the one who would bring peace as his very character description, as who he is, the Prince of Peace. And John here gets to answer the question, who's the benefactor of peace? Who's in relationship and who's under the reign of the Prince of Peace? Who can stand? He gives us at least two major answers. The first he describes is the 144,000, chapter 7, verses 5 through 8. Now, it's not like we're counting 144,000 and stopping. It's not like heaven fills up, no vacancy. Instead, it's the numbers of totality, of completeness. 12 times 12 times 1,000, the fullness of those in Christ, 12 tribes of Israel, the 12 disciples, all of God's believers. He's saying there's room for everyone. He said those who are in Christ, those who are alive can stand. There's a second group, though, too. He continues, and we go from earth to heaven, to the throne of God, to the altar, and we find those who are standing before the throne and before the Lamb, verses 9 and 10, and they are clothed in a white robe. They're those who have died, who have seemingly been discarded by the world, those who have been crushed or cut away from life, and yet we find this picture from heaven that they have been crowned by the Prince of Peace. So this should bring two clear teachings for us. The one is that relationship with Jesus is critical. It matters that we're in relationship with the one who offers peace. And two, it should broaden our world. It should remind us that there's a larger unseen world than the seen world we invest. And we get glimpses of this. Why can dogs smell what we can't? or bats who fly by sonar, or bees who lose electromagnetic fields around flowers to draw them, or sharks who find lunch through electrical charge. There are worlds that we know are out there, but we can't sense. And John says, I have one more for you. A spiritual window that you don't often look through, but that nonetheless shows you what is real. A world beyond our world a place where success is recalibrated, where victory is redefined. See, while victory oftentimes is defined by crossing the finish line first, think of Usain Bolt blasting away the competition, running so fast that he can turn back and kind of mock the other runners, like, where are you guys? You coming? There's a race in history that the Greeks embraced, in Athens specifically, that had a different outcome, a different objective. It would become a famous part of the Olympic Games and festivities. So the unique Pan-Athenic Games had a race that wasn't just about finishing first. It was about also finishing well. Called a, a torch race. You guessed it, a relay race where runners would carry a torch and they would pass it from runner to runner to runner on their team. And so it wasn't just about finishing first. It was finishing well with the torch still ablaze. You only won. The flame still burned. See, John here speaks to us like a coach, guiding us through our torch race, through this race of life and faith, pushing us not just to finish first, not just to cross the finish line, not just to get through it, but to get through it well, to ensure that the flame of faith is still intact. See, sometimes people put out their flame, they extinguish it in order to be first, in order to be popular. They changed their theology to be light. But it's interesting. It hit me a couple weeks ago, again, a new 
that people make theological changes and you can watch how they always move them towards being more popular, not less. Towards what is spiritually convenient rather than biblical conviction. Right? We start going back and we say, how can we reinterpret this to match what I want it to be? But instead, John's message isn't change the word. He's saying, keep the word at the very core. Become tenders of the flame. Protect the flame. So how do we do that? The first thing we have to realize is that the flame stays ablaze not by relying on external conditions, but by an internal underground connection as our fuel. Think about the Kennedy's eternal flame. It burns in snow and sleet and rain because its fuel source is underground protected. Where can you make space for God to be part of your daily walk, your daily rhythm? So that no matter what's happening around you, the storm around you will meet the peace within you. But here's the second thing. The world is crazy. (laughs) Shocker. You don't need to take notes on that. See, but we keep the flame burning by creating windbreaks. Just like a farmer out in the country, they put those rows of trees that break the wind up, right? That stops its ferocity from blowing away siding or barn doors. And in the same way, our faith, we need those windbreaks, those stoppers, those places that are kind of barricades to the outside world, the community that allows us to live with a faith that can still burn. To not just go and get bigger, but to grow better together, smaller. Maybe through small group, maybe through a small group of people who share your faith and can iron, can sharpen iron. See, Paul speaks of the torch race. Second Timothy, he said, I fought the good fight. I finished the race. I've kept the faith. He encouraged those in the Corinth church. He said, run that you may obtain the prize. The author of Hebrews says, right, run faithfully, run with the flame ablaze. Let the run with endurance, the race that's set before us, looking to Jesus. See, the world that we can't see is bigger than the world that we do see. And that's key the relationship if we're going to maintain our faith in a crazy world. See, we run through these seals and they say, man, here's who I'm talking to, those with relationship in Christ, but he's not done, right? That's one puzzle piece, but two more to come. We move to the trumpets. The end of the world, six trumpets, a pause, and then the seventh. And in between that pause, in the midst of it, we find the answer to a next question. What are we supposed to be doing? Why are we here? Maybe you've asked yourself that. Why? Am I on this planet right now? Is it to collect another stimulus check? Is it to just take up space? In Revelation chapter 10 through 11, 15 is the interlude here. And specifically, chapter 11 begins to give us the insight. Starting verse 3, he said, I will appoint my two witnesses. And they will prophesy for 1,260 days, clothed in sackcloth. They are the two olive trees and the two lampstands, and they stand before the Lord of the earth. That's important. Two olive trees, two lampstands. If anyone tries to harm them, fire comes out of their mouth and devours their enemies. This is how anyone who wants to harm them must die. They have the power to shut up the heavens so it will not rain during the time they're prophesying. And he goes on to describe the works of Moses and Elijah. Right? We look at the same tribulation from a different angle. A connection to the Old Testament, Zechariah chapter 4, the two witnesses, Moses and Elijah representing the law and the prophets. God's word that points us to a life of ethical living and a life that pushes us to see the fullness of Jesus. The DNA of Jesus, promises, prophecies that he fulfills. But I want you to get how this speaks to us today. Think of it, the word is those olive trees And the olive trees produce olive oil. The oil that's meant to burn in the lampstand. Revelation chapter 1, the lampstand is the church. So we have the oil, we have the lampstand, and we have the light that comes where the church becomes this shining city on a hill. An ideal, a hope, an aspiration of what could be as we're connected to the head of Jesus Christ. Not a perfect gathering, but a perfectly imperfect one. 
A place where we become the laboratory of love, where we work through hard moments and conflict and disagreement and real life struggle together, loving with God's love rather than ours. Preparing internally those acts that we're going to need repentance and forgiveness and reconciliation and challenging conflict that says, listen, you're wrong here, but I love you still. All of these things that are desperately needed in the world around us. Jesus says, church, guess what? I'm going to provide the word that is the oil. You are the lampstand and now burn bright. It's why you are here. It's why I've planted you where you're at. See, beautifully, in this passage of Revelation, it's the only time where people repent. See, the reality is that if you're a part of a church, but you're just watching, if you're just a bystander, church will quickly become stale, boring. It'll stop speaking to you. It'll stop filling you up. But if you become the church, if you're in a community preparing you to go out and equip others to engage, to disciple, to bless, to love, it's life-changing. It's time we turn church, not just from an address, but into a verb, hashtag churching. It's time that we get busy because that's why we're here. So I can tell you some distant story of evangelism that's powerful and profound. They're out there by the hundreds. A ministry, a missionary, domestically or internationally, historically or modern day. No doubt. Those are great stories. So I'm also captivated by the stories that don't make the magazines or the television shows or made into movies. The story of regular people embracing an everyday faithfulness. A neighbor inviting a neighbor. A friend walking with a friend. Think about your own experience. The most profound moments probably in your faith and life in general has been because of a who and because of a what. So maybe you're part of a church because who someone has become because of Jesus and what they did in response. A who and a what. See, my hope is that because of who you are, in Jesus, and what you do in response, that someone else will have a story. People don't follow organizations. People follow people. So my challenge for you is how do you become a person that people can follow in the spiritual journey? The question is, how do we evangelize? How do we actually do it? It's great to say, live your faith and love and oh, have spiritual conversations. That's great, Stephen. <laughs> Golf clap at your sermon. But how do we actually start that? How do we actually do it when it's kind of awkward to talk to your neighbor because you got to live with them if they say no? All right, and they start to drive into their garage and hit the button without getting out of the car or they take their trash out to the curb when they know you're asleep. Like, that guy's weird. That family's kind of freaky. So how do we evangelize in a, in a natural, relational way? So the first is just an invitation, I'd say. Come and see what God's doing, right? No commitment, just come and see. Tom Rainier, in his book, The Unchurched Next Door, pointed to research that 82% of people said they'd at least be somewhat likely to attend church if they were just invited. Just so someone saying, hey, come see if you're interested in what I'm doing. Or in relationship, number two, try prayer. 21% of those who are religiously unaffiliated, even at times atheists, admit to praying. Why? Because when life gets hard, they're still turning somewhere for answers. So you get a chance to be light and dark. Office to pray for someone. Very infrequently will someone reject just, hey, can I pray for you? Number three, let me challenge you. If you're inviting, if you're praying, why don't you try to bless someone? See, so create margin in your life. Set aside some time in your schedule. Set aside some resources. Doesn't have to be huge amounts. Doesn't have to always be money. But set aside something to bless someone. A meal. A cup of coffee. Your time. Do it with your kids. Do it with your family. Do it with your friends. See, while church-sponsored outreaches are great, sometimes I think the best evangelistic program is no program at all. But it can include coffee, bagels, breakfast sandwiches, lunch or dinner, 
could include your inexperience or your life experience, your work or your leisure, any hobby that's not immoral, children in school or an empty nest or anywhere in between, your hard moments or your praiseworthy ones. Hopefully you get the point. God can use every area of life as a way for you to reach out to someone who's in the same area of life. So ask yourself the question, where I'm at, who around me is going through the same thing? So scripture says that God comforts us so that we can be a comfort to others. What if we began to look at everything through that lens? God's blessed me financially so I can be a blessing. God has comforted me so I can comfort. God has encouraged me so I can encourage. And at that place, you no longer just go to church. You're doing church, right? Hashtag churching. Right? We've seen these seals. And God says, I'm talking to those in Christ. We see the trumpets and he says, listen, here's your purpose. Here's why I have you here. But we got to put the final puzzle piece in place. We go to the bowls, seven bowls, right? Six of them, a break, and the seventh. This interlude is one verse. Revelation chapter 16, verse 15. It answers the question, okay, how do we prepare? How do we live? Look, he said, I come like a thief. Blessed is the one who stays awake and remains clothed so as not to go naked and be shamefully exposed. See, if you were expecting Revelation to tell you exactly when Jesus is coming back, some roadmap to the end of the world, you're going to be sorely, sorely disappointed. But Jesus gives us something better. The third beatitude found in Revelation, he said, blessed is the one who stays awake, who remains clothed. See, to be awake We find Jesus uses this idea in Mark chapter 13 for someone who is on guard, who's alert, who's waiting for the master to return, who's prepared, who's living in a way that's ready for relationship. It speaks to ethics. It just pushes us away from some spiritual narcolepsy where we just keep falling asleep. We just fall into a pattern of life. We just fall into sin. He says, no, wake up, stay awake, stay on guard, stay alert, keep living the life, even when it's hard. Because the master's returning. And then we get this nakedness. Which is more than just the physical condition of living life streaking right across the football field. Maybe that was you in high school. Great. But John has in mind the words of Isaiah chapter 20 verse 2. The challenge. Isaiah says, is told by God, go and preach to him naked. That would get your attention on a Sunday morning. The Lord said, just as my servant Isaiah has gone stripped and barefoot for three years as a sign. He says, people, listen, the Syria is going to come and they're going to strip you and leave you barefoot. Nakedness becomes a symbol for spiritual loss. It becomes this idea of being exposed. How you're living, open, seen. See, all throughout Revelation, the challenge has been clear. Be found wearing the white robe. Be found living the life of purity. Live the life of fullness. It's a reminder, how we live actually matters. Not because God is keeping score, but because God knows that in relationship with him, the output, the growth of that is a life that is transformed, a life that's changed, a life that is not perfect, but progressing. And so today, let me challenge you, don't just walk out of the dressing room in your birthday suit. Be found clothed and stay awake. For just a moment, though, I want you to Try something. I want you to close your eyes. And I want you to imagine what it would be like to be blind. Imagine trying to do what's probably simple for you now, but would become much more difficult. Imagine trying to separate medications. Being blind, imagine trying to find the right button on the microwave. I struggle with that now. Right? It, it, without just being able to see, imagine trying to catch a bus, trying to figure out what's the right side of the street that this bus is going to come. Do I have the right bus? Think of all the questions that would arise as a sense of not being able to see. As I was thinking about that, I found just in passing a nonprofit app out there in the land of apps called Be My Eyes. It's this really creative app that allows those with visual impairments to partner through their cell phones, through their cameras, with those who can see. 
It's this act where the, the people who can see lend their eyes to the person who can't. The inventor of this is a visually impaired man in Denmark. As he envisioned it, this Be My Eyes app recently allowed a young man who couldn't see to use his cell phone, and he shined it into his fridge at the top shelf. And he asked the woman somewhere else in the world a simple question. Is this milk still good? Should I take a risk and drink it? She looked at the date through his camera, and she just told him simply, listen, I, I wouldn't risk it, right? Try something else. Take some orange juice instead. But the, the, the amazing interaction, isn't it? She was willing to lend the person who couldn't see her eyes so that he could live better. And as I think about that, I start to think about the, the Christian life, living as human instruments, where God offers to lend us his eyes in our blindness. So we can walk not by sight, but by faith. He allows us to see, to act, to engage in new ways, to see people who are ostracized, marginalized, those who seem fine and stable and perfect, but still need what Christ offers. To engage in work that sets off a party in heaven. Jesus said in the same way, I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over the 99 righteous ones who don't need to. Because you get to see what heaven sees. So the way you live is how you witness what you are willing to make livable becomes believable to the people around you. So like the artist, though, at the Farm Progress show, I go back to that image over and over in my head. It's only when you see the pieces come together and you find the right vantage point that the overarching story pops. After the last drop of paint, after the spinning of the canvas, after the craziness of the world, when he stops that canvas in the right spot, you see the message. And John does the same thing. He says, I, I know these seem disconnected. Right? You got seals and you got trumpets and you got bowls and the world's ending and ending and ending. And this book is crazy and maybe confusing to you. But he says, see the simple picture. The faithful can endure whether in life or in death because of the cross. He said, we're offered the purpose for life to be the one who takes the oil and allows the lampstand of the church to burn bright, to be a shining city on a hill. And that we get to come together to form that community by living differently. It's a big picture. But it's not just about viewing the picture, it's about joining in the mission. So today, by invitation, I just ask you to wrestle with a simple question, what is your next step of faith as we take on a new year, as we look towards a new life at a new you and a new world? What's your next step of faith? What's going to happen when the picture pops and you see why God has put you here, why you're watching this, why you're engaging in all? But it's not by accident. Look forward to taking the next step of faith with you Feel free to reach out to us. We'd love to pray with you. We'd love to talk about your next spiritual step. We'd love to be a resource to do life together, to see the full picture. God bless you guys. Take care.